listening to the PR Wind Down Podcast, the show for public relations professionals who are ready to see real change in the PR industry. We are your hosts, April White and Laura Schooler. Let's get ready to wind down. All right. Welcome to the PR Wind Down. Let's get started with the horror story of the day. Laura, do you want to do the honors? Certainly. You, April, do you sit around all week so excited for what the horror story might be? Honestly, it is a highlight of my week. <laughs> it's like PR Christmas. Okay, here is the horror story, and it's the first time that April or myself are hearing it. Here we go. My first PR job was at a small agency as an executive assistant. The agency was relatively new, and there were still a lot of things getting ironed out as people got into the ebb and flow of different tasks and processes. Being part of a newer company, your job description is rarely just the job you're hired for. And it seemed like some of my coworkers at the time weren't too happy about this. We've talked about this before, April. Okay, a few weeks into my new role, two employees in particular started sharing some nasty gossip with me, really just bashing the founder of the company. I mean, really, who does that? I usually keep to myself, and I'm relatively friendly with everyone at work. I think it's important for your coworkers to get along with you and feel comfortable enough to chat with you. However, these occurrences started happening more and more frequently and I just felt uncomfortable. I didn't want to talk to these women at all. I've never been the type who would speak negatively about someone, especially behind their back. Despite my own tendency to be brutally honest, being stuck in the middle of these two hens clucking away was a bit out of my comfort zone. <laughs> I became fairly close and friendly with my boss over time. I was her assistant, and as a result, we were in constant contact. Hearing the comments that I knew sounded outlandish and catty just felt wrong. It felt to me like this gossip was a situation where somebody said one thing, but my colleagues would twist it to appear to be the victim. Mm -hmm. One of the women who happened to be in a senior position at the firm was constantly trying to push her own work off to me. At the same time, she'd bash my boss who had recently been nice enough to give her extra hours when she needed the income. Finally, after hearing enough of the gossiping, I finally said something to my boss. There were red flags all over the place with these two women that I noticed almost immediately. One thing led to another and eventually more information surfaced and the company ended up letting that employee go. Talk about snakes in the grass much. <laughs> So wait, I, I got, maybe I read it wrong, where I said, but my colleagues would twist it to appear to be the victim. So maybe it was whatever was being talked about, they somehow figured out to make it sound like it was about them. Is that what that means? I think it probably means, you know, when people are the one at fault, but they deflect that responsibility by making it out that they were victimized by someone else. Yeah. I think that's probably. I mean, it's sort. Is it that is? like, you know, the the person who accuses others of being a liar is probably the biggest liar of all. <laughs> yes, it's called reaction formation. Oh, is it? It's a psychological principle of accusing others of that which you do yourself. So right, people who don't lie don't even think about that other people are lying or don't even know how to go about it. So the people who are like, oh, she's lying, it's this, it's that. It's like, well, you seem to know an awful lot about lying. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, they always say that oftentimes the person accusing the other partner of cheating is right. the one cheating themselves. Cheating. Projection, the, that's the word yeah. I was looking or for. Or the person most likely to actually cheat. People who don't cheat don't even think about it or how to go about it or what to say. So then the person who is thinking about it and talking about it, like clearly knows a lot about how to cheat. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. No, so, but it, it's too often. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. So it yeah. sounds like there's a little bit of that. And it also sounds like immaturity, like not being very professional. Yeah, I think that too. It definitely sounds like a case of deflection, like you're saying. And even that, you know, when you, when you start to goad each other on or you get, cause you know, you know how that happens or one person gets sour, but it's really because they 
can't deliver or they can't rise to the occasion. They right. Can't. So they want to bring everybody else down with them, right? So that they don't <laughs> yeah. seem so bad or feel so bad. Yeah. So they get everyone else sour and then they start, you know, there's always some like, and yeah. honestly, I've been that person. So I know what that's like. <laughs> so I'm not above this. I'm not trying right. to put down, like, I've definitely been a hot mess of a 20 something that couldn't. You're still, you still are a 20 something, right? Thank you. Yes. So no, I mean, I, I've definitely been a hot mess of a, of a 20 something that just didn't have her stuff together and made it everybody else's problem. And then got, you know, turned everyone else against the person that allegedly was the problem, even though I was the problem. Right. You know, what do you do? Like when you work somewhere where the boss actually is a complete nightmare? If the, if the clucking hens were correct in the yeah, boss. Yeah, right. Boss. And, and like the boss was so bad and the only way that anybody could survive was by like commiserating with each other. Well, I've been there too. I mean, I think that the best thing to do is to keep your mouth shut and get out of there. Yeah. Because commiserating never makes it better. It no, just, it doesn't. It but helps, you don't know that when you're, helps, you know, 20 something. Yeah. It helps you survive it. I remember being at a job after I had had many, many challenging jobs. Some jobs were good, but the people were challenging and some the, the jobs weren't even good. And then I got a solid, really good job where relative to like the agency world, the people were halfway decent. And there was a woman there who would just complain and bitch and complain. And then I found out it was like the only job she had ever had in her life. And I was like, sister, you don't have any idea how bad it is out there. So it is a little bit tricky, but it sounds like in this case, the person who wrote the letter didn't seem to complain about the senior person, the boss at all, right? It was just right. these other people who did. So I think that it was a case of like, either A, something crazy going on in that person's private life and they were kind of bringing it to the office, yeah. or B, they just maybe weren't very good at their job and so they wanted to like, you know, throw up flares so nobody noticed that they just stunk. Cut from an agency owner perspective, that's the kind of thing where if you want to have a culture intact, you got to pluck that thing out as fast as you can spot yeah. it because otherwise that toxicity just creeps into everything and yeah. ruins it. It's like this ruinous personality or this ruinous moment in time can just tear the whole thing down. Or when new people come in and that person like, you know, of course we'll run after them immediately and try to poison them against everything else. And the new person doesn't know. Which may have been, well, yeah, that may be the situation that this person was in, right? But so, so if that happens to you, you have to step back and not take the bait on a complaining worker. If you're a new person and somebody like runs to like be your best friend so right. that they, you, they can complain about the job or somebody who works there with you, that is a huge red flag. Right, because you're about to get your butt in the sling too. And that's probably the person who causes all the problems to begin with. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You don't want to be affiliated I mean, with that person. Right. What do you do if, if it is like the track record of the boss, so to your point from before, what if mm -hmm. the glass door reviews all say that the boss is a horrible person and all these horrible experiences have been had? So I kind of had that situation once where it wasn't that I read about it, you know, the person being horrible, but I even knew in the interview that the person was not my cup of tea. Okay. But I had to get out of where I was because that was the sinking ship. Okay. So I needed to jump somewhere else. And in theory, the job that I was trying to jump to was like a really good job. It was just like the person that was going to be horrible. And in yep. my younger, naive thinking I could like take on anything, I took the job and it was a really, really bad environment. And, you know, I, just because I'm me, I just like hung in there as long as I could. And then I eventually, you know, went and got another job, but I was there for a while. Well, the funny thing is, is I think that was a, a job where said person was let go before I, before I left because other people caught on that. Aha. Right. So that's another thing. If somebody's so bad, if you can hang on there, that if that person is so bad, you can hope that maybe that they will be dismissed of their duties. So if you're trapped in that situation, it doesn't look like there's a uh, light at the end of the tunnel. As we always say, you just got to keep it moving. Yeah. Try to get a new job. Yeah. 
Hey, I think I see our guest Tara joining. Let's let her in. All right. So today on the PR Wind Down, we have Tara Wyckoff with us. She's an assistant teaching professor at Penn State's Donald P. Belisario College of Communications, where she teaches senior capstone courses in PR. She's here to discuss the principles of good mentorship and setting young people up for success as they enter the working world. I also want to chat with her a little bit about how agencies are looking for diversity and staffing and, and the best ways to go about that. So I would love to kick it off to Tara to just jump in wherever, if, if maybe give it just a tiny bit of background of what capstone courses mean. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. So the senior capstone is exactly that. It's a PR capstone uh, campaigns course. So typically the students create a campaign for a real client and they see it straight through from conception to implementation, sometimes even to the evaluation stage, depending on, on how far we get. So I am the last stop before they pack their bags and start their careers. Nice. So what are some of the challenges that you discover they're facing and how do you address them to make sure they're set up for success when they go into the job market? You know, I think it's really changed. I've been doing this for 10 years and I think that I would have given you a different answer every one of those 10 years. <laughs> and so pre-COVID, I would say some of the main problems that I was seeing is um, a lot of students don't, when they go into PR, they don't necessarily think of PR as a business. And so just like sort of basic business acumen was missing. And one of the things that I try to impress upon them is so many of their clients are going to be businesses. So I think one of the challenges pre-COVID, of course, was really getting them used to thinking about what's important to their client. And to their client, often ROI is what's, what's driving so many of their business, their marketing, their operational decisions. And, you know, and, and students sort of need to understand at least the basic con concepts there. So, mm -hmm. Right. It makes a lot of sense. I heard you say pre-COVID. So what are the post-COVID concerns? <laughs> oh, they just want a job, right? Um, it is a little bit different. My advice to them used to be, uh, you know, to really think deeply about, you know, what they want, what they need, and, uh, you know, finding the right fit. And I found that last year in May, my advice sort of shifted to get a foot in the door, right? <laughs> you know, take some, take whatever you can get. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Take whatever you can get. <laughs> It seems like good advice though. I think you can learn from any experience. That's the other thing we, we talk a lot about in this course is that I do believe a significant part of your first job is really just learning what you like and what you don't like, what you're good at, what you need help on. You know, your first job isn't a make or break. Your first job is, is still really you exploring the industry and, and yourself. I mean, I'll just speak for myself, but I think I speak for more than myself that like, <laughs> Unless you're in the business school or like you're one of those kids who like had their own business, you know, in high school or college, no kid knows shit about business. I didn't know anything. I didn't know one thing. I agree. I, you know, yeah. I made a mistake. Probably one of our first, one of the first semesters I taught, our client was our local bank. Um, and I brought in the VP of the bank and, and we, he gave this great presentation. He had this specific PR need and semesters are 15 weeks long and so about five or six weeks into the semester i realized oh not a single person in this room understands what a bank is <laughs> i was just gonna say what you put money in and then you get it out when you need it that's what i knew a bank was <laughs> so you know just just yeah. sort of understanding the bigger picture of right. what's important to your foot because really at the end of the day your client wants you to care as much about your their business as they do yeah and so that's what i try to impress upon them if it's a bank you better find out you know how a bank works and, and what's important to a vp of a bank april and i have talked about this the thing is a lot of times agencies will hire people right out of college or shortly thereafter and give them some client like a bank and be like go get pr for this account and like i mean you might as well have been speaking greek to these kids <laughs> and i had it happen to me i talked about it a few months ago it was, you know, during the dawn of the internet in terms of like how it was being applied, you know, to businesses and to consumer use. 
And I remember they were like, we've got an ISP. Go out there and get PR for an ISP. I was like, great. What's an ISP? And even was like, it's an internet service provider. I'm like, great. What does that mean? Like, you've no idea what's even going on. So, yeah. It is true, though. I mean, I think in PR, you think, oh, I just have to know about communications. Right. But then it turns out, no. And then, and then on top of it, a lot of times you get thrown into the mix of interfacing with the marketing or advertising agencies. And suddenly you have to know something about SEO and you're in meetings about that. And then you have to know things about, it's just, it goes on and on and on and on and on. So I feel like you get out of college and you think you have, you think you're at, you know, ground zero and you're ready for anything and, and you discover that you're not even close. You know, the, one of the things that I say here immersed with so many undergraduates is, you know, your roommate may be an accounting major uh, and you probably can't do accounting, but your roommate probably can do some level of communication, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he can probably do some social media, maybe do a little promotion, understands the media a little bit. And so we talk a lot about, you know, if you're positioning yourself as an expert communicator, what does that mean? And to me, a lot of that is that you have superior listening skills and the aptitude to teach yourself, to get up to speed and to draw all these connections to all of these cool things that maybe you've read or you're interested in or you've been exposed to. You're like this great connector because I, I love your example of being thrown the ISP client because that's, that's really true. Of course, yes, you may want to go into sports or fashion, right. or, you know, you, you have this idea of what industry you want to be in, but yeah, you might, I, I had a former student come back and talk to people and say, um, the first brand I worked on was uh, Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> she was talking about, you know, di you know, digestion <laughs> issues, um, you know, and immersing herself in that. So just, you know, really impressing upon them to hone those communication skills and, and that keeping the curiosity really, really sharp. Mm -hmm. Are there traits that you've seen that you, you saw somebody in college and you had an idea, you know, that they were going to be good and then it turned out to be so are there, you know, are there things, are there sort of indicators that somebody is going to go on to be really successful in PR? That's an awesome question. I'd, I'd say kind of two things. One, I play this little game with myself where I try to imagine where the student's gonna wind up in terms of like kind of functional skills. Like, oh, that's the media relations person, you know, like that's the person that's gonna go strategy, that's the person, you know, who's not gonna go into PR. In terms of, you know, indicators in general, I, and maybe a teacher is not supposed to say this, but it's not always a one for one in terms of your academic success and your professional success. Right. And, you know, I try to tell them by that class, no one in the real world wants to ever see a class presentation ever again. I never want to see a class presentation ever again. Like we need to switch this out of academic setting to a pitch, you know, or to business writing or write me a quick email. I'm not reading a seven page background analysis. No right. boss ever has done that. <laughs> right. But that's what the students are asked to do in the classroom. Setting. Right. And right. No, I didn't, I had no idea I was going to go into PR. I was really looking to get more into politics and government, which I did. And then that's how I got into PR. But I, a couple of younger people that I've been working with the past two or so years told me, and a lot of them had been in a PR program, and they said a lot of what they learned was sort of like not at all applicable to actually working at an agency. And it was more about public policy sort of issues, like these big sort of academic theoretical issues that unless you were going to go into public policy, like not really going to deal with it. Maybe if you work for some big publicly traded company that, you know, is in a pack or something like that, but most people aren't. Yeah, I mean, I certainly can't speak to other programs. I can say that the capstone's as real as it gets in my class, <laughs> but it's to shake off a little bit of that academic flavor of writing and communicating. And so I'm not going to read all the research. You're going to read the research, right? And then you're going to provide me with the actionable data, right? You're going to provide me with insight. And that's a huge 
like those of us who came up through the industry, we just kind of learned that on the job. Learning that in the classroom is really hard and it, it's mm -hmm. hard for them to transition because there's no exact right answer. And especially PR students are usually super type A, you know, goal oriented students. Outgoing, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the main indicators. I can see the students, you know, you can kind of see the wheels in their head turning and they're drawing connections and they're bringing in things from other sources that they've read or TV yeah. shows that they've watched. That, that curiosity, that you can't teach. It's true. I agree with that. And, and Tara, you also mentioned to me that a lot of agencies, I don't know, how did you phrase it? Just they were looking for how to add diversity to their staff. I know there was an interesting issue there. Well, you know, we bring in a lot of guest speakers. So we bring in a lot of people from the industry and often our conversations offline, outside of class, would lead to them sort of saying, hey, we, you know, we've started these great recruitment efforts to diversify our workforce. And, and of course we feed into these industries. And so I think they were kind of looking at like, what is the university doing to help, you know, like help in that initiative. And, and I'm really proud of the, of the initiatives that we do here at my institution. But one of the things that I was getting is chatter back from my students who would then go into these agencies is, you know, they, they put their money where their mouth is in terms of diversity, in terms of recruitment, but they hadn't figured out the inclusion <laughs> part. Right. And, you know, like that's a real problem. And, and one of the things, like one of my soapboxes that I get on is this notion of the socioeconomic constraints of our industry, right? So like a lot of my students, who want to go work in New York in an agency are paying a lot of money for rent. They're not getting paid very much. They're working around the clock uh, so they can't get, you know, second jobs. And who are the people who are attracted to that? Well, usually they're, they're students who already have a safety net. Yep. You know, they're, they're students who can maybe rely upon their mother or father to, you know, bankroll the first three months or the first six months you're going to just keep getting more of the same student if that if that's what the paradigm is. So mm -hmm. so I love that my students don't just look at the major metros. A lot of my students look um, at really different organizations, different size, different locations. So that's my soapbox. I uh <laughs> No, I agree with that. Yeah. Right. So that so they're the only kids who can get into the schools that teach these things that can get you the internships and then they're the only kids who can afford to have those jobs in those cities and that's what perpetuates it, right? For my first job was for um, a government agency in New Jersey, and then my second job was for a United States senator, but for his home office, also in New Jersey. And in the government, they've been uh, way more focused on diversity from even way back then. And I worked in Newark, New Jersey, and it was a super diverse in terms of cultural backgrounds and a lot of women in very senior positions. So that was my like entrance into like the working world. And then I went to work at agencies and big companies in New York City. And then it was right back to like rich white people, more or less. I mean, with, I moved back in with my parents for four years. I couldn't afford to, you know, live in a cardboard box. So maybe that's why a lot of these other markets in other cities, you know, in the South and stuff, where it's way more affordable to live and you can arguably not only afford it, but maybe you can have a life or have a second job or something like that. But I, I agree. I guess if anybody who owns a business doesn't think that their employees aren't doing a side hustle, they're crazy. Another thing I couldn't have done now, especially now during coronavirus, you're home probably, and you've got, you're the internet and you're getting clients over here and you're getting clients over there. You couldn't do that when you had a full-time job and you had to be there in person in, you know, the nineties, right? I think that um, we're even seeing the squeeze of that right now. So with students online, they are finding out, well, I can do this intern. Everything's online, school's online, the internship's online, and they're kind of burning the candle from both ends too. Mm -hmm. You know, being a woman, I kind of grew up in that you can have it all kind of <laughs> mantra. Mm -hmm. and, and I learned quickly that you cannot have it all at, all at the same time. I right. do worry a little bit about telling our young people. You can have it all? You can have it all, all at once. You know, that multitask, I think multitasking has a little bit of a myth to it that I mm -hmm. worry about. <laughs> but the thing is with most people, and uh, you probably run into with your students who want to be in PR, the type of student you're talking about, they're crazy multitaskers, right? Yeah. 
they sure. probably like are belong to a sorority and have uh, you know some program that they're in and they're you know athletics and volunteer at the homeless shelter in town, whatever. I'm sure they do a ton of stuff. And you do have to be that way to be in PR. And April and I have talked about that too. Like you can't just be like somebody who does one thing or somebody who has to like, you know, sit and read for four hours. I mean, it's just it's just not possible. And I guess April, we talked about it because I have run into because I've worked in-house at places. So most of the people I worked with were not PR people. And they right. thought I was out of my mind because I was like, okay, next, okay, next, okay. And they're like, no, we have to mull this over and rewrite it 10 times to get a committee. And I'm like, why? Like, woo, next, what's next? And so I think that that's, uh, <laughs> it's I, definitely, I, I, yeah, it's definitely the right personality type for PR. I think that your students are better off. Yeah, so don't worry. So you're not getting old and don't worry about them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say, even if they are able to afford the place that they're working in and they get at an agency in a location where it's, you know, it's affordable for them without help from a, a trust fund, <laughs> you know, I, I still find that in a lot of cases, agencies have this kind of overarching vibe that you're supposed to fit into. And even as somebody like me, who is like a Midwestern white girl, I didn't always feel like I knew how to do it either, right? So, I mean, I can't even imagine if you were thrown into a situation where you're, you know, everyone's from Central Casting, as one of our guests once said, and it look they all look the same, and they all, you know, it's like the Santa Monica firm that all everyone wears pearls, and you have to wear these fancy things, and you have to make sure your hair is curled, and or the New York firm where you have to, you know, there's the don't wear stockings. Stuff, where you, yes, I got in trouble for wearing stockings. We've covered this a couple of times. So, um, yeah, <laughs> this is a while back, but, but like, there's still like, and then there's the, the New York agencies where you all have to wear a suit and then how, do, how the hell do you afford a, a suit. suit to wear five days a week and not, and not wear the same suit all the time? I mean, it's, it's crazy. And then how do you, you know, then you've got the fashionista firms where you're expected to like, look the part, like you, you know, dressed from the devil wears Prada, but you're making barely enough money to afford your rent that's pay taking your half of your paycheck how are you supposed to look the part like it, it's yeah. crazy so there's all there's that yeah. problem too right and then there's on top of it i feel like it's not inclusive culturally because if everyone's supposed to be and act and look and talk this and dress the same how in the world are you going to include that somebody diverse? that right it's not diverse it's just adding it's like oh can you look the part of this kind of person with a different skin color great <laughs> like that's not the same right you're you're right you're the same person you just look a little different but don't act different and don't talk different and don't say anything weird because we will shun you right I think that that's one of the it's one of the hardest things to share with young people as they're going out and interviewing right and you say all the cliche things like don't forget you're also interviewing them and you know all the all these great things that you're supposed to say to them but how do you assess the culture of a place when you're 22 years old and you've also not been exposed to any other corporate culture, right? Like that's really hard to convey to someone right. is to try to uncover that. Like what's the vibe you get? And I do, I do often say like, these are the, you're going to spend more time with these people than your family, right? Like this is the person who you're going to have lunch with. Sometimes you're going to have breakfast with, sometimes you have breakfast, lunch and dinner with. <laughs> But I think that you're right. I mean, I, I guess I graduated during a, a, a low time in, in employment. It was not easy to get a job. It was just get a job. Not even in PR, just get a job, any job and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so and that's yeah, why I love that you're interviewing them too. Can't you, no, what do you know? You know, but everybody says that and then you try to do it. And it's just such, it's this like hokey made up thing. Exactly. And maybe like, they like me, they like me, maybe they'll hire me, maybe they'll hire me. Right. <laughs> me. I, I couldn't believe when I got hired, like by somebody with a real job and a salary with health insurance. I was like, I mean, if you, if I had won the lottery, it would have been less surprising to me. <laughs> that, and that's why I usually tell them, you know, it, your first job's not forever. Just find something that you mm -hmm. can get out of it. Like real selfishly, what are you going to get out yes. of this? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a big brand that you can put on your resume. Maybe you mm -hmm. hate the job, but you walk out of it with a big brand or connections, or maybe you learn something you've always wanted to learn SEO and you never did. And mm -hmm. now you're going to learn on the job. Um, mm -hmm. So to kind of be real 
selfish (laughs) in setting some goals for yourself. And then I think the other thing that's a little tricky is who you're working with, right? And so in a lot of larger PR organizations, the person you're kind of reporting into is still on the hunt for her next big promotion. And that's a really tricky thing. Having been around a while and been a mentor, you know, for many years myself, it's hard to mentor a young person when you're still on the hunt, right? Like when you're still climbing, Uh, that takes a lot of maturity. And so often I think what happens is your boss understands that you're somewhat in competition for her job in, in eight to 18 months. It's, it's tricky. So, I I mean, I, I think that often it's just good to kind of look around, not directly in your line, but just look for other people in your company that can be advocates, maybe not even mentors, but just advocates for you and Mm -hmm. somebody you can connect with. Maybe that's why I um, always got along with like old men. They weren't in competition with me and I was not in competition with them. Funny. We've had we had uh, one or two of them on the, <laughs> on this podcast actually. We have, yep. Yeah, no, they were great guys. It takes a generous person. It really does, yeah. and and it's hard to be generous when you you know are hustling still. It's yeah, really yep. when you're that's true. It's very true. Tara, what kind of mistakes have you seen new people people that are new to the industry make that we can share not to make them feel bad to anybody rising in the ranks that's about to enter the real world like the kind of yeah the what not to do like laura said yeah i think um a big thing in transition that i see students who transition successfully to to their career and those who don't i think a lot of it has to do with self-awareness it's a lot easier to take feedback in this like in my safe little classroom than to get it from your boss within the first six months of working. That, that's, you, sometimes students don't weather that really well. And so they, they internalize it. They get really stressed out about it. It becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. They just become worse <laughs> at whatever the issue is. So mm-hmm. getting that feedback, you got to grow a tough skin this last semester with me so that, so that you're ready for that. Yeah, that's really good advice. And I've, I've definitely seen that before, you know, especially if it's a situation where they've never been told no, and they've always been a superstar and their parents, you know, or like they had the parents that everything they did that was magic and, you know, they could do no wrong. And then suddenly they're in the real world and it's like, that's never going to work. And what do you do, right? How do you, how do you come up against that for the first time in your life when money's on the line and you're, financial stability is on the line. Okay. I mean, that, that's psychologically really jarring, right? It needs to happen, but oof. So it's good that you're doing that to help that's, them make yeah. that leap. That's, that's a big one. And I think the other thing I've mentioned sir, before is that the writing, short, short, shorter, shorter, even shorter, <laughs> more concise. <Yeah. laughs> no one ever wants to read a term paper again, you know? And so the quicker that you can make that transition, the, the students who don't make that transition get a lot of negative feedback and then they're right back in that loop of, of feeling not confident. Mm-hmm. Right, or they, or they think it's the, some, the boss or the agency's fault and they move to the next job and they make the same mistake and then they blame this, a new boss or a new agency and they make the same mistake and it's like they, just, they don't even see that they're the one creating the, the cycle over and over and over again. Yeah. And I think just like the third one, and all of these are so related to, to self-awareness, is just this idea of staying maybe a little too long. Like there are going to be wrong fits, bad fits, not, not good cultures, not inclusive cultures. Um, you know, maybe I, I think sometimes the, the name, the brand, the, um, the glamour mm-hmm. <laughs> um, kind of blind, you know, blinds them <laughs> a little bit and then, and then you're not getting much out of the, it's a very one way of relationship and, and you're not getting much out of it. And so I've had students who've gotten their dream job and stepped away from it and said, gosh, I'm so much happier doing this 
you know, maybe in a smaller agency, maybe part of the country that they've always wanted to live in, or maybe part of an industry that they want to be part of, and making that big decision to step away sooner rather than later mm -hmm. often leads to happier people. Those people are, are my former students who call me happy. Well, Tara, Tara, what, what other advice do you have that we haven't covered or what other questions do you have for us since we've been asking all the questions of you? Oh, this, that's good. So I, I'm kind of curious about the flip answer. Like, what do you think is a good indicator of someone who's going to be a great contributor to your team? What do you look for? That's a really good question. A multitasking is definitely one of the primary things, especially because Lauren, I've talked about this before at the entry level position. And then when you're really senior, you are overseeing way too many things. And that's the nature of basically the financial stability of an account, right? Because at a junior level, you can't be doing enough of the work to be doing the meat of it. So you end up doing kind of the, you know, the crumbs of it. But to get enough full-time work to do that, you have to be picking up a lot of, you know, like juggling a lot of plates. And then there's a middle, there's sort of a sweet spot in the middle where you're, you know, mid-level professional and you have a normal amount of things to oversee and a lot more responsibility within those set things, but it's slightly less Higher stressful. Higher expectations, yeah. maybe. <clears throat> yeah, you're more, yeah, you, you, you have to kind of rise to the occasion and, and be managing them, but it's fewer yeah. things because you are in the trenches and like more vertically ingrained in the accounts. Then you get promoted out of that and suddenly you're back to having way too many things and overseeing 10, 20 accounts, right? Or whatever. And new business and staff and, and new, <laughs> you know, finances. And like, and, right. You're back to the beginning, but you're, you, but you have all of the responsibility. If you don't thrive on that, I think that's an issue. I think if you don't thrive on kind of being thrown in the deep end, if you're the kind of personality type that you're bored, if you're not doing something, you're not exactly sure how to do. I think that's the right fit for you PR oh, because that's, that's great. I'm stealing that. I'm going to, I'm going to tell that to my students. That's perfect. That's and, perfect I, and I, and I know because I'm one of them, right? So I get, as soon as I know how to do something too well, I'm so bored. I'm so bored. I need a new client. I need an industry. I need a new challenge. I need a new something, you know, <clears throat> and I feel like people that are, um, that are well equipped for PR is similar. It doesn't mean they have to be aggressive, but I think it ties into that curiosity thing that you were talking about. And I think it's, it's the sign of somebody who's curious and wants a new challenge, you know, just thrives in, in that. So yeah, I always used to say I was like happiest when I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which sounds crazy, but it's, you know, it's just, I think it's a good, it's a good trait for this industry. I would say that being a good communicator is obviously a kind of a no brainer, but that encompasses a lot of things. That means you're a good writer also means you're good at setting boundaries good means you're good at managing up that means that you're good at you know anticipating somebody's needs and getting out ahead of it and kind of being intuitive about personalities and where somebody's what somebody's gonna where their breaking point is right what's gonna make them crazy what's gonna what's gonna really make their heart sing and then I would say as an extension of that as a bonus, if you're the kind of person that can get along with anybody and anybody can get along with you, then you can go anywhere, right? Because that's just the kind of, you're dealing with people. It's a people business. I love it. I'm yeah. Here. That's making its way to 1035 class tomorrow. Ooh, all right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's awesome. This was so much fun. I really, I came to you through a former student of mine and I was so happy to, to be introduced to you. I, I mean, it's funny, like I can't even remember one name of one professor I had in college. I never talked to one of them ever again. <laughs> so, 
So that actually speaks highly of you also, right? That she has that kind of fond memory and, and connection to you. Well, yeah, it, the feeling That's, is mutual. No, no small thing. It was a pleasure to meet you both. Cool. Thank you, Thanks. Tara. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Laura, the horror story of the week is very similar to the what not to do from PR pros who knows it's like very beautiful synergy here <laughs> so the the what not to do from PR pros who know is don't gossip about your managers to other coworkers at work it doesn't end well for anyone oh that's probably why in our that letter that the other person got let go or part of part of the reason why they got let go they probably got caught you know Gossiping. talking crap yeah the thing, okay, so there's a lot of angles here, I think. But the main thing is if you gossip about a manager to other people, you are giving those other people fuel to get you fired. <laughs> You're giving them the ladder with which they will climb up and you will get knocked down. Mm -hmm. and that is the main reason because let's, you know, you got to look out for number one. That is the main reason that you should not gossip about managers. What do you think about that? I think that I think it's very smart. I mean, that's a very strategic reason not to do it. Obviously, there are like lots of, you know, spiritual and karmic reasons not to do it. But... Oh, karma shmarma. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that you just went straight for a very practical application of it. I told you um, I love geometry that last week uh, right? you did right. tell me that right. you that's did where i go that's right a so squared makes... plus b squared equals c squared <laughs> well because right, at the end of the day what are you trying to accomplish right like the hr lives for that kind of thing right they love to go up to you right. like especially a big company and be like you need to have a talk with you you know they right. love to be like this cool more i'm telling you what you did wrong right. Yeah, um, and, but it's, like I, and it's, it's very unprofessional. It is bad. Um, it's really unprofessional too. Because the right. other thing is, I, I've always, I've also noticed that, you know, if you complained about your last boss and how horrible they were, and then the boss before that and how horrible they were, and you're the boss, what's the likelihood you're going to be the person that they complain about next? Like right. pretty much a hundred percent. Right. So if you're well, a manager and mm -hmm. you hear somebody doing that in an interview or otherwise you don't want to hire that person yeah because they're you know they're just going to become a sour patch kid and they're going to end up you know <laughs> they're going to cut like like infiltrate the ranks of otherwise happy workers and eventually try to pull you down who wants to hire that person yeah now again going back to what if the manager really is a terrible manager or a horrible person or whatever yeah I mean, I think it goes back to the same, you got to find a new job. Yeah, just get out. If or it's not bad, get, get out. Right, what are you doing wasting your time? Every amount of piece of energy and time that you put into complaining about the boss, you could be looking for a new job. Yeah, and don't, like we said, don't go to HR because that isn't going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> don't go to some scene, don't go and complain to people. But sometimes, maybe 50% of the time, I don't know. That person who you want to complain about because they're so bad is literally so bad that other people learn it and know it and they eventually do get pushed out somehow. But you got to be really patient with that. And if you right. aren't a patient person in that way, get a new job or get transferred to somewhere else. Right. You know, and it's so funny because you watch like, I was just watching that a new TV show, Flack. Yes. So I just watched one or two episodes today and it's so funny. I mean, it's, it's more about like celebrity PR in London. Okay. And, and so it's just like so hilarious. I mean, it takes all of the like crazy issues we deal with and just totally, you know, turns the, vo the heavy volume on it, but it's sort of, you, you got to see some of it because you're going to be like, oh my God, some people are really that horrible. You know, they have like the young assistant who doesn't know anything. And then like the bitchy, hot publicist person who works at the agency who's so mean to her. <laughs> it's like, right. okay, yeah. It's, you know, like the devil wears Prada where you're like, yeah, I've worked since somewhere like that. Right. Not all PR, like that's not all PR. If you work no. for like a, like a PR firm that has a lot of like B2B tech clients, mm -hmm. it's usually full of like nerdy people. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, very sort of demure, 
nerdy people. If you work at some like superstar publicist agency, then yeah, it usually is like swimming with the sharks a little bit. <laughs> so I feel like a lot of times it's the industries that you're in yeah. that dictate the attitude a little bit. Right. I think we uh, had a good conversation about that. Why don't we move on to another scintillating topic? <laughs> it's scintillating. <laughs> so there's some interesting PR news. Yes. Recently, I think it was last week, that Rolling Stone magazine, and the news is it still exists. No, that's not the news. The news is that, <laughs> that they are seeking, quote, thought leaders who are willing to pay to write on their website and you have to pay two grand. Yeah, I'd be part of the Culture Council. I guess it's, oh, an invitation only community for innovators, influencers, and tastemakers. Oh, I guess the Guardian sort of like saw some emails that maybe wasn't for anybody's eyes, but the Guardian got them. And it looks like there's a vetting process and you'll have the opportunity to publish original content to the Rolling Stone website. And that doing so allows members to position themselves as thought leaders, and share their expertise. Right. I mean, this is the same business model that Forbes is using. And then the drum also, you know, the, the marketing and advertising publication mm -hmm. also has something called the drum network. And there's two different levels. It's quite expensive and it's similar, but you get not just like you can write for them, but you get more and the two different options. And the, the second one, you in theory get uh, access to like CEOs of, you know, potential clients. More or less, it's the Forbes idea. Mm -hmm. Well, they're even calling it a council, right? And the Forbes council is the, th yeah. is the same thing. And you're on different councils depending on what industry you're in, right? Yep. So this is sort of the way that PR and advertising and marketing are dovetailing. This has been building for a long time now, this sort of mm -hmm. pay for play. My biggest concern is that real journalists have been getting kicked to the curb more and more and more and more, and they must be furious about this, that I read so many stories about freelance journalists never getting paid or not getting paid for six months or getting paid, you know, $300 to write an article. And meanwhile, they're going to allow yeah. other people who aren't journalists to pay Rolling Stone to write. And it's like, why would anybody in their right mind go into journalism? It's, and I think it's a problem. Yeah, my bigger concern about it is just that it's really hearkening in this news as opinion yeah. and that the objectivity of the news is just disappearing by the day. Well, it, right. It's, so it's, it's, not... all, it's all propaganda. It's yes. all opinion. And it's all has a slant. There's no such thing as objective news that tells both sides of a story. Right. It, it's just that art form is being lost. And I feel like from a PR perspective, it's amazing because now you can use the media as a propaganda machine. Mm -hmm. When in the past, that was something that was like frowned upon and pretty much impossible unless you, you know, you were like right. pulling, pulling strings at a big corporation that had huge ad budget at the media outlet or whatever, right? But, but right, now- but even then that was that, I didn't see that happen too much. It may have happened at the very high levels, but I think that, it was still up till recently, like the church and state separation in big business was still pretty separate. I saw in other industries where it was like, if you buy an ad, you'll be able to, you know, then maybe they'll right. interview your guy. Right. But now it's just like, that's no. all out the window. No. And then I was laughing this morning when I saw the, the news summaries and it's like, oh, the media, you know, the fourth branch of government. Like, <laughs> and there was even a story about how the media is now pushing Biden to, you know, act in ways he wasn't planning to. I was like, when did this become part of our governance? That, that, that's so strange to me. Right. Instead of writing what Joe Biden is doing, they're asking him questions in press conferences or writing opinion pieces telling him what he should do before he's done anything right or wrong. The man's only been president for seven days. <laughs> no, and they're already pressuring him to do what they want. Like they're a constituent. I can't even get my brain around it. It's like living in the twilight, zone. especially you, as somebody who like, you know, wasn't that, I, I, yeah, I graduated in 2000. How did in 21 years that we go from objectivity in the news to everything is not bad and everything is propaganda and yeah. everything is I mean, like social media is like, I think the huge, 
It's got to be. It's got to be. Yeah, it's got to be the main. And is this reaction now from the media a reaction to Trump? Like, are they now like, we're not going to let anybody walk all over us. We're going to tell this guy what to do. I mean, is then is this like them finally feeling like they're somehow empowered because Joe Biden's not going to tell them to shut up and go away and ban them probably from the newsroom like Trump would do? I think this was in swing before yeah. the Trump era, which created the the vacuum for the Trump era. Right. But I mean, so Rolling Stone hasn't really been driving the cultural discussion for a long time. If it was the New York Times or (laughs) saying, we're going to pay you to write for us, Mm -hmm. the sky would be falling. Rolling Stone, a magazine that hasn't been relevant in my mind since, you know, 1989, is doing this. But, But, you know, I mean, they're still around. And it also goes to show how difficult it is to make money in the media. I mean, these companies have to do this to get alternative sources of income. Right. I mean, it's working. It's yeah, working I mean, for of, Forbes. It's, yeah. Forbes, for sure. I mean, they totally changed their business. But it's just a really unfortunate for people who wanted to be professional journalists and writers. Right. It's that much harder to be that. Yeah. And you also have to be uh, affiliated with a company or a person who is able to afford $2,000 to be able to write a story for Rolling Stone magazine, where back in the day, you know, you didn't pay anything and somebody interviewed you and then read a story in, mm-hmm. in the magazine, right? Yeah, I find it pretty alarming. Although I did immediately send it to somebody in the music industry that I think should probably be a contributor. So <laughs> right, <laughs> I don't, I don't love what it means for the state of the world and journalism. Yeah. As a publicist, I'm thrilled. Right. I mean, so as a publicist, as a human, as being, somebody... as a human being, I'm horrified. <laughs> right. But as <laughs> somebody in PR, you have to become aware of these things and add them to the mix of strategy that you suggest to your clients. And it goes well for them and it does add credibility. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I mean, I think my question is, at what point does this model because as we've talked about a lot the value of pr is credibility building right Mm -hmm. at what point does the media sell itself so far into the ad realm that that credibility building piece disappears that's my so here's my question it's my long-term concern do you think most people who read forbes have any idea that the forbes council is like any different than just a normal Forbes article. I don't think most people know what it means. So the question becomes, at what point do they know? Just the way that, you know, there was a time where people didn't understand advertorials. Right. And now we all know what they are. Right. But it might catch up, you're saying, to that point. Yeah. And and yeah. So my main concern is that eventually people are going to catch on because they're not dumb, right? They're going to figure out that it's an advertorial, essentially. And then they're going to figure out the other news outlets are doing that. And then at what point does it become that people just aren't even sure what's actually paid for, what's not, you know, the credibility of the media is gone altogether. Well, if that happens, then our democracy, well, democracy, right. Our, our industry is the least of our worries, right? Our industry is gone, but then there goes, right. There goes democracy. Unless something rises up to fill in behind it and takes its place. And there's a new model right of media that comes forward but then uh, but then they're gonna you're gonna have the culture war because you're gonna have the established media that's already got all the money behind it saying it's fake one i've seen a couple of surveys recently where they said like who do you trust you know the media the government you know your next door neighbor and the highest on the trust chart now is business that's which is like the exact opposite of what it would have been in the 70s or something right it's crazy. Yeah. When business, which is totally self-interested, is the thing that people trust the most, like, I don't even know what you do with that. I, it means that trust is gone. Well, and in, a, in a way, if you think about, nobody is foreign to the concept that the other things we're talking about, government and media, are all at the mercy of the funds that come from the companies. <laughs> but it's all a big stew behind the scenes. You know, it's like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but at least with business, you know what they're invested in, you know what their interests are. 
if they don't do a good job, you can actually pull your support from them. Yeah. So in a way, right, so I mean, maybe it's like, more upfront. You're saying I think there's more transparency mm-hmm. in business than any other, in, you know, any other right, sector. Consumers feel like they have more ability to to vote. fight back or right. vote. That's very grim. We need to end on a very on a uh, on a, a higher, higher note. note. <laughs> I'm looking around, I don't know what can I do. I could go get the guinea pig and show him on camera. Oh, is it nearby? Yeah. Do you want that? Yeah, I'd like to see hey, a guinea pig. He's hairless. One moment. Is he like, is he Mr. Bigglesworth? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know Mr. Bigglesworth. Okay, here's Fred Johnson. Fred Johnson. Oh, wait a minute. Is Why is your guinea pig named Fred Johnson? This is Fred. Oops, he's got a little thing on him. Fred. Do you see him? Yes. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Can Fred Johnson do the closing? I could try. Does he read? No, but I'll pretend he does. Thank you for tuning in for the PR Wind Down podcast. (laughs) (laughs) And thank you to our guest, Tara, for joining us today. Remember to submit your own agency (laughs) stories and questions. We appreciate your support. If you share our store with your friends and colleagues, it'll help us reach new listeners like you. So don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating. (laughs) Oh my God. <laughs> if you have an anonymous PR horror story of your own, <laughs> send it our way at the contact email below the episode notes. We can't wait to wind out with you again next week. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a PR horror story of my own right now. <laughs>